spending money in the Aussie used car market. Top used cars, SUVs and utes are worth more now than 18 months ago. Should you sell while the market remains red hot? Yes, it's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode 193, Used Car Gold Mines. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and joining me in this money-making market assessment are Cars Guide Adventure Editor Crafty. Hello. And key contributor Steve. Good day. We'll open the B&D roller door and peer into the far reaches of the Cars Guide garage in these COVID-constrained times, looking back on our hero cars and memorable drives. Then we'll dive into your feedback. YouTubers, you can plot your own adventure. You can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's hit the starter button. And yes, used cars. Um, Byron, our own Byron through the week, wrote a very compelling story. Uh, putting the proper suit, could you be sitting on a gold mine? There's potentially easy money to be made, and it's sitting right on your driveway or in the garage. Um, so he has been able to identify particular models that have been um, at the forefront of this market trend that we've seen where because new cars are a little scarce, the used car markets come up with demand and uh, the prices um, in parallel. So I don't know whether either of you guys are kind of casual scrollers or, or of the, uh, the used Excuse car. me? <laughs> you know, of certain websites, Crafty, not, not those, <laughs> but, you know with used cars for sale, much like our own, um, and uh, have noticed this trend. Um, are either of you aware? Have you been in the used car market lately? I was looking for a car just before I got locked in my house, and uh, I was looking about $10,000 to spend, and I could not find anything that I thought was worth the money. Wow. It, it was staggering how little you could get for $10,000. I really thought that would get me something Yes. Something I could, uh, something I didn't want to drive myself, but that I could use as a family car and maybe save up for my son to learn to drive in a couple of years. But the 10, 10 grand gets you nothing. And there are people out there making, you couldn't even uh, negotiate with people. People making really good money on secondhand polos, old i 30s. I, I thought I could get a Mazda 3. Mazda 3 was way out of my wow. budget. So I was shocked, shocked. Yes. So this story, uh, this story alarms me in that way, but more because my one of my, you know, wise after the fact things was when the last VF Commodore came out, I said, if I had any money, which I've never had, if I had any money, I would buy one of these now <laughs> and put it away because it will definitely be worth more. And people laughed at me, but uh, uh, it turns out I was right. But, I mean, I suppose the assumption there was that it would have to be some kind of special model that would, would appreciate over time, but it's not. It's even your your cooking variety, you know, ordinary evokes and what it will. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get no, to that. It's, it's we'll get everything, to that. JC, and it's been obvious since the whole um, the global situation that we're currently in. Uh, kicked off. It's not just real estate that has gone, uh, you know, bonkers. It's not the real estate market that has just gone bonkers. It's secondhand cars. And, and that was evidence, uh, I don't know, early on last year. And things that you would expect that would, you know, resell pretty high, like, you know, any Toyota pretty much or, or Land Cruisers and that sort of thing that generally uh, draw a high price tag secondhand. It's not the case anymore. It's everything. So everything yeah. has skyrocketed. Um, I'm not in the market for a second-hand vehicle at the moment because uh, I don't make the big bucks like Corby. But um, in I, I, and I keep an eye. <laughs> and that was my the, annual income I was originally to spend. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's before tax. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I obviously keep an eye on it uh, like everyone else, um, and we're part of that sort of realm. It's... It's a big surprise because it's it's bucked the trend of pretty much everything else. And the other thing is people are locked in their areas, their regions, their states, uh, effectively. And so travel, you're pretty much limited to what you can do, you know, uh, to what you can drive. So yeah, yeah. And, and I, I don't know, um, you know, consuming overseas auto content. It's the same, I know, in the States um, and, and uh, a lot of Europe. It'd be good to get feedback. I know we go to all points of the globe. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it'd be good to get people uh, give us their stories from where they might be. But it's not, it's not just Australia, that's for sure, too. No, not at all. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's if you guys uh, agree, let's just look at some of the models that uh, Byron called out as particular specials that you should probably be putting the for sale sign on. And, and actually to that, I'm sure you guys like me have got your local outdoor car yards where people tend to just park their cars and put the sticker in the window and say, this is how much it is. 
I've noticed the turnover in stock in those ones is very, very uh, rapid. Um, so yes. <laughs> even even the casual car yards are going. But but the Toyota, you mentioned a crafty Toyota, um, pretty much a go-to in terms of resale value. But the RAV4, so the previous gen RAV4, 2013 to 2019, Byron's saying in early 2020, a clean ex-government or previous private uh, owner, uh, RAV4, um, two-wheel drive with around 100,000 kilometres on the clock started at $12,000 or from about 15 for the more desirable all-wheel drive. Yeah. Fast forward to today and you're looking at 18 yeah. uh, and nearly 30 uh, for yeah. an up-spec, you know, GXL and whatever. That's madness, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's, it's a good car, it's, but it's just crazy. It's new car prices, isn't it? I mean, if you're looking at something, you know, to suit a, a, a smaller budget. Um yeah. I, and I mean, it's a good thing. It's it's a good vehicle. You're always going to get that Toyota tax, like I said, with a second-hand Toyota. It's always going you're always going to get bitten by that, and you sort of go into a, a purchase of a Toyota expecting that. But uh, again, it's a whole new world uh, in which we live. So I thought the Toyota no surprise. Taxes, the Toyota tax is having no personality. <laughs> but, uh, Ooh. Ooh, but I, I, just can't, I can't believe we live in a world in which a RAV4 is so desirable that people are paying yeah. that much money for it. But you can see what I struggled with the 10 grand budget. It's, it's yes. not, not giving yeah. me a RAV4 that I wouldn't want. Absolutely. Well, I wonder, yeah. is, there, is there a philosophical thing here where people are, there's a flight to certainty, you know, where in, in uncertain times you want something with a, a, a very strong reputation for reliability where you're not going to have problems going to dealers and things and Maybe Toyota is just one of those brands that people cling to when they're a bit uncertain. I think so. For for better or worse, they've they've still got that um, that reputation uh, that that harks back, you know, a long time ago. Um, some people say it's it, you know, they don't deserve it these days. Some people say, yep, it's still the you know the greatest thing around, mm. um, a Toyota. So, you know, good luck to people. Nice. But geez, there's some big prices, hey? Well, yeah. look. Steve, you touched on it before. The other, another that Byron's called out is the Commodore, being the VF Commodore. So the last uh, locally, as in produced in Australia, Holden Commodore. Um, you've got six figures, uh, low kilometer SSs and HSVs, prove that those values are already there. But he's saying that it's just your garden variety evokes and sv6 grades if they're original and regularly maintained they've bucked the decades-long trend of free-falling depreciation uh, for aussie sedans uh, they dipped below ten thousand dollars in early 2020 they're now 15k minimum the sport wagon uh with fewer than 150k on the clock that were 12,000 18 months ago really fetch under 20 now so they're, they're on this upward trajectory, which again begs the question, is now a good time to offload it or is, mm -hmm. is there more in it? But it certainly backs up your uh, VF Commodore thinking, Steve. Well, it does dismantle our uh, previous argument about reliability, though, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe people aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't that interested? No, I mean I I love that car. When, it, when I remember yeah. driving and thinking it's such a shame that this that we can't have cars like this anymore. And and I remember thinking it'd be fantastic. It's a perfect family car for me. It's, it's the perfect family car that was outside my budget. But even an SV6, I'd be happy with. It was, it was just such a good thing. And I I'm I'm relieved to see the prices now currently kind of where they where they deserve to be. I think I'm surprised yeah. that they dropped as low as that. I wish I'd picked one up then if I'd been on it. But ten thousand dollars. I mean, fantastic. and the sport yeah. wagon. It's oh, interesting. Yeah. Byron mentions the sport wagon because it is such a good looking car. It, unlike mm. you, I thought the VF was a real triumph. A really good Aussie made uh, um, sedan, um, and the wagon was just outstanding to look at. Really good job. Mm. And that appeal um, to Australians, like you want, it should be it should be a collector's item. You know, the last of its kind kind of thing. And yes. it'll be if you hold on for it long enough, you'll be able to sell that at summer hats. But you bought several crafty. I know that you uh, <laughs> yes. squirreled, squirreled a few away. You've got the eight, <laughs> that's six, right, yes. all kinds of it. Yeah, that's right. No, exactly. Yeah. How many is Byron no. bought? How many how many of them is Byron bought? That's Byron just bought. sold one. He just sold oh, really? sport, he just sold one of wagon. one of 38 that he has. <laughs> it's honest, <laughs> honest Matthew Darkest Motors. He's got he's typically <laughs> he's typically got the shipping container on the corner of his, his yeah, front just ready to go. Special yeah. of the week up on the top of it. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I thought he never bought anything larger than like a citron or a leaf. I can't imagine him as something that big, but there you go. Yeah. Or, well, he does buy newer cars. Uh, yeah. yes, he had he had a leaf, he had a row 80, he had an NSU RO80, I think. 
Um, but he's got a Mazda 3, he's got all kinds of things. Um, now, and he's obviously got too much disposable income. So yes, well, exactly. the journalism has worked out for him, stuff. It has. <laughs> yes, or maybe it's just a front. Uh, good on you. It's the car dealing. It's the car <laughs> dealing. That's how it makes it. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Honest Flipping Matthew Darkest Motors. Yeah. Um, now, Crafty, this is a good one uh, for you to maybe take the lead on. It's a car that I've always had a soft spot for, which is the FJ Cruiser. Mm. Um, and for what it's worth, when I first saw pictures of the FJ Cruiser, I thought it was hummer size. I thought it was yeah. really a big yeah. oversized thing. Yeah. Not yeah. at all, based on the Prado. Yeah. Lots, lots of fun. And yeah. you could take it off-road. It's not a hardcore off-roader, but I can yeah. absolutely see the appeal. What about you? Yeah, well, it goes pretty well. I mean, it is essentially a, a Prado with a sort of sexed up, you know, uh, sexed up uh, exterior. Mm. Um, very popular, kind of polarising when they first came out, and, and, and Corby will take up that. But, you know, some people hated <laughs> it. Some people loved it. Um, mm. I still see a lot of them around and actually, you know, off-roading. So, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of them kitted out with aftermarket gear. So people fully embracing the lifestyle. And I see a few of them, you know, around cities and suburbs and whatever that aren't so kitted out. Uh, a good thing, you know, yeah. and again, that old Toyota resale value. I mean, whether people will probably hold on to them because they're actually part of their family lifestyle and, and that sort of thing. Maybe yeah. there are some people out there with, with, ones that haven't done a lot of Ks and ones that haven't been thrashed off-road? Well, well, Byron's saying today they start at 35000 with sky-high mileage, yeah. while examples with under 150 k range from forty to fifty five grand. Yeah. Yeah. Again, new, yeah, new, new car FJs prices. <laughs> advertised for nearly 70000 Yeah, it's um, crazy. It, co it costs under fifty k um, when new. So maybe yeah. those are some of the customised ones we were talking about, the full black ops treatment yeah, or, you know, yeah, whatever, yeah, but that's, yeah. that's staggering. It is. It is. I don't know how you guessed crafty that I wouldn't like it, but you, you, guessed, you guessed correctly. <laughs> My best mate's sister's bought one, and I've been telling you to sell it for years, so I might get on the phone. Get rid of it. Hers is bright get yellow. It. it looks like something the banana split should be driving. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely horrible. Get so her on the blower, mate. It, get her to sell so it. So you can turn on the clock. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. It one banana, two sad. banana. Yeah. It, 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 at least it's interesting for a Toyota, but not interesting in a good way. Yeah. Well, just, it, well, it was at the at the pointy end of that change for Toyota where they started to become more adventurous. You know, the FJ Cruiser, then you had the 86 and, and various, you know, that was all starting to come yeah, in. Yeah, it was a yeah. bit of a marker for that. Yeah, but 86 was, is yeah. good. 86 is good. <laughs> 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 they have two ends of a different spectrum, we, I think. Man. I did spend a little a, bit of time in an 86 once. It was fun. It was good they fun. are great. Yeah. And well, closely well, related to like one a, of the cars coming up. Like a go-kart. Yeah. 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 We, we do have a family member that's a bit of a canary in the coal mine for motion sickness. And I know the FJ Cruiser was a, a no-go zone for that person, um, <laughs> particularly in the back seat. You've got those oh, yeah, yeah. clamshell doors. You're feeling a bit closed in. Yeah, bit, bit yeah. it is one of those real sort of cocoony sort yeah. of narrow field of vision out the side when you're yeah. in the back there. And oh. it, yeah, it feels a bit too it's snug. The car for that I just had a Honda Civic Type R recently, and it made everyone in my family car sick every time they went in it. Oh, stop, really? stop the car I'm getting out. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. just your driving, though, mate. I mean, but it was my driving. Crazy. That's yeah. true. I think you've been diesel. Yeah, you're so hard on the brakes <laughs> and then hard on the throttle, and then you're yeah, that's right. it's like a washing machine effect. <laughs> Doesn't ride well either. No. Oh, that, uh, yeah, <laughs> that too. Um, now, here's one which is right smack bang in the mainstream, which is the Mazda 3. So, again, we're talking 2014 to 20, so it's uh, the previous generation. Um, it was the first post-Ford version of the Mazda 3. Um, and it's going gangbusters, it, you know, up against the likes of Corolla, Civic, Focus, all of these mainstream brands. And Byron reckons autos with under 100,000 kilometres barely drop below 16 grand, rise, rising to well over 20 Wow. For mid spec Winky. grades, while uh, exceptional examples of the luxuries and sports variants are still near 30 grand. So that's exceptional, too. I mean, do, do, are we paying a Mazda tax, or is that just emblem <laughs> emblematic of the, the broader market? But can't you get a new one for 30 grand? Pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> I <laughs> think. Yeah. Like I went to a Mazda dealer when I was doing this whole car research thing, and I went to a Mazda dealer thinking what I could get for. 20 ish, if you, you push the boat out, kind of thing, buy it as a company car or something. But you could, you, Mazda actually have vehicles. You can get a Mazda 3, but we, yeah. the only one I could afford had a plastic steering wheel. I just couldn't live with that. Do, uh, do you yeah. normally buy cars on behalf of Corby Corporation or, or do oh, you yeah. have it as a, a private vehicle? I let the minions drive them. I don't That's drive right. them. I only drive Ferrari. But <laughs> Corby Corporation. <laughs> the, the minions need to get drive something to get my lunch. Uh, but no, my, uh, 
yeah. my wife's madly in love with that Mazda 3. Like that, yeah. it, 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 I love the current one. I think it's a fantastic looking thing, but people really love that previous generation, which is like pre pretty. But, uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. It, her love for that car is just all about how it looks. But again, the problem with I've had with that car is that the kids don't feel the kids get a bit car sick in the back because of the way the back windows go up. It's Obviously, just about yeah. not being able to see yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, and the new one, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I know it's a, it's a polarised, it's a classic polarising design. I'm in the really love it camp, and but I get it. Other people, you know, the opposite. Um, yeah, someone said they found it too masculine. Too masculine? Really? Which is, that was Tim Keane, actually. Our good friend Tim Keane said he found it too masculine. Right. Well, I mean, Tim is pretty fluid in his gender identity. I don't That's know how true. that goes when it... It's transposed <laughs> on the motor cars. I don't um, think of it as masculine, I have to say. I, I yeah. think it's beautiful. I think yeah. it's a great looking Alfa Romeo copy. Yes, yes. Now, well, it's not the first time for Mazda. I want to say, was it the Mazda 1600 in the 60s was originally going to be an Alfa? Anyway, people out there will know more than me and, and correct me on that. But uh, I doubt it. Uh, now, those second hand uh, prices are crazy, aren't they? Those they are. for those, for a speaking about uh, crazy. Crafty, this is one very close to your heart. Navara, you are. Oh a, yes, you are a Navara owner, but um, <laughs> I am. How many? How many don't, say, don't say it with so much venom, JC. Uh. <laughs> Matthew Darkus, Matthew Darkus Motors has identified. Honest, has, yep. honest, honest Matthew Darkus mm. Motors um, has identified the D twenty three dual cab four x four as a particular hotspot, um, but he's saying. A quick search for a sub 100,000 kilometre D23 dual cab means having a part with 30 grand and upwards, depending on grade and condition, while the smartly attired STX autos are currently nearing 40k plus. So where do you yeah. stand on that, Crafty? Do you, do, do, does that represent solid value for a vehicle yeah. like that? Well, you stand well, out the front with a for sale sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a my, mine's even older, Corbs. Mine's 2009, so it's a D22. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, much hated generation, <laughs> well, mine anyway, with the two with the wheezy two point five liter oh. turbo diesel. Um, but um, so yeah, I'll I'll be I'll be tacking sixty grand on that and putting. Well, it does it, have the crafty. It, it has so. the crafty graphics pack as well. It's a crafty right, limited yeah. edition. Yeah, which you is basically just it, blood. Yeah. There's people out there who'd want to drive it. You know, yeah. pretty craft, craft. It's like at the bottom at the bottom of the auction, or you know, this is yeah. formerly the Marcus Craft <laughs> yeah. Navara. Yeah. Exactly. The John Lennon Rolls Royce, the yeah. Marcus yeah. Craft Navara. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's a good unit, JC. Again, got its fans, got its haters. Um, I'd expect that its its sort of skyrocketing popularity would come off the back of perhaps some people not being able to get exactly what they want and sort of having, you know, they're knocking on to the next best thing or the third best thing in their list of vehicles that they want to get. Yeah. Uh, it's a good unit. And, uh, you know, if you're going to start nitpicking, there are a few things, um, you know, that you might not like. I, I enjoy the things. They've, they've made a, a decent um, four-wheel drive uh, ute. For a long time, yeah, um, and uh, yeah. So again, those those prices don't surprise me in the in the you know the world in which we live right now. Yep. Um, they'd be outrageous any other time. Could, could, could mm. this be a factor of you know we know uh, that camper trailers and and all of that stuff is going through the roof as well. People are holidaying domestically where they're able to. Um, yeah, they're, they're not flying overseas. They're spending their money on something to. to to hitch up and put behind their vehicle, and they've discovered they need a, a tougher vehicle to do it. Yeah, I'll um, give I'll give our Australian yeah. listeners uh, the drum, mate. Um, there are, you know, like the the camper trailer and caravan market um, has been pretty much gutted by demand. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll drive around and you'll see camper trailer and caravan yards that are a bit bare bones and that sort of thing, because you know now supply is a problem, but. Uh, and I give our listeners this tip in Australia, For wait, a, wait yeah. a few months. I think people have bought into the, the, the idea of the lifestyle and then they realise, well, actually, I don't really like this sleeping. Crap. Yeah, it's crap. crap. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like towing. I hate it, you know, blah, blah. And uh, in a couple of months, there'll be a lot of brand new things uh, on sale, um, perhaps for a little bit less than what they were purchased for. So pe people trying yeah. to offload them. Um and uh, yeah, because I see a lot of camper trailers and caravans, a lot of them new, sitting in people's front yards and not going anywhere. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah I'd expect that. A, a well, they're a bit like a boat, aren't they? I mean, the, yeah, the, I was say. 
they the say the best boat. day, best two days you spend with your boat is the day you buy it and the day you sell it. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It's, exactly, maybe, it's, yeah. maybe it's a bit like that with your camper trailer. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who, who really do use them and really embrace the lifestyle. But yeah, I'd expect that a few people would realize that they're not yeah, fully sort of uh, immersed in the lifestyle when they've, when they've spent a little bit of time with one. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Now we'll, we'll, the last couple, um, HRV. Honda HRV. Mm. Here you go. Small SUVs are all the rage in in the new car market. Um, so you're talking 2015, circa 2015 type uh, HRV. Uh, they're going through the roof. A low mileage version can fetch nearly twenty five thousand dollars. They're hot property on the second hand scene, says uh, dealer principal Matthew Darkett. Honest, uh, honest, yeah. Hon- honest, yeah. honest buyer. You know, yeah. come, in, come into my uh, office while we discuss the finances. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's normal patter. I can get you in this car for money you wouldn't believe. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's unimaginable to me that you couldn't do something more interesting with twenty five thousand dollars than that. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's the reliability thing again. You know, the right. bomb proof. Yeah. It'll go forever. But yes, it, it doesn't seem like an exciting decision. Whereas no, I think, I think no. the, the one car we've got left in is the one that makes sense to me. But this one, not so much. Because here you're talking maybe it's Qashqai CX three mm. uh, Suzuki Vitara. There are other options if if you're in this neck of the woods, and I suppose they've all appreciated as well. But um, and none yeah, of those right. are ugly. Well, let's let's <laughs> let's let's cut to the chase. Let's get to the finish line on this one, and it's the Subaru BRZ. And I'm sure that the Toyota 86 would be in a similar boat. But Byron um, has picked on the BRZ, and he said that you know, with under two years ago, with under eighty thousand kilometres on the clock, they could be had for about fifteen thousand dollars, depending on the spec. Um, today, the same cars kick off from 23 and 25. So, oh, sorry, um, he was also talking about the MX-5, would have been about 18. So now you're talking 23 and 25, respectively. Uh, so there, I suppose when they first arrived, people thought these might be classics, you know, in time to come. These will be cars that will be sought after by enthusiasts down the track. It's just that that's been fast-forwarded to, to 2021. But this, this thing makes perfect sense to me. Like now you can't go overseas. You can't have that holiday. It's the tour you've always wanted to buy yourself. Have, let's, let's buy a car that I can have just for pure driving joy. And yeah. I love the 86, but I'd have the Subaru just because the Subaru bad just makes me happier. And okay. they, they drive them back to back, there really isn't very little difference, but they're both fantastic cars. Okay. And I'd, I'd have an MX-5 for the same reason, just for pure driving joy. It's the, it's the you can't have a Porsche because they're too yeah. expensive. You can have this and it gives you the, a percentage of that same um, driving Crafty, feel, you, um, you, you rented one to impress people at your school reunion. <laughs> that, was the, that was the time you were in the 86. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Took me uh, about half an hour to get out of the thing, in and out. I was about to say, um, was, there, was there a, butter and oil involved? <laughs> Pretty, <laughs> as there always is, Corby, you know. Oh, yeah. um, in in but, general, uh, Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I had one for a year as a, as a, as a company vehicle in a wow. life. Yeah. And i got to say. As an erotic dancer. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. No, yeah. I actually ran the club. Uh, oh, yeah, right. I thought so, yeah. Yeah. And the uh, Toyota's decision to put those not, you know, they're not high performance tyres by any stretch. They're more kind of eco high mileage type uh, Michelins, I think they are, um, made it just so in- exciting to drive because mm. even at around town speeds, it, you could feel it moving and, and um, oh. you're really connected with the car, which always made me scratch my head when people would put the big rubber on and, and you know, a one inch up in rims was always a standard kind of thing. I enjoyed it on the standard tyres because. At the slower speed, you could really get in tune and, and have fun with the car. I, I agree. It's, about it's that car, that, that and the MX-5 is a car you can have fun at legal speeds. You don't need to be yeah. going fast to feel, you know, yeah. to feel like you're alive. It's yeah, great. great little like snick snack gearbox. Oh, was, great gearbox. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. All right, well, that's good. If uh, any of you out there have had experience with those cars or others, let us know where you stand. Maybe you've just realised that the vehicle that's in your driveway should be wearing a for sale banner at uh, Honest Matthew Darkest Motors. Um, I know he'll, he'll sell it on consignment, typically. He's, uh, he's happy to take a small commission. So uh, let us know. He only, he only takes an 85% commission, doesn't he? It's, it's quite it's, reasonable. It's reasonable. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's probably industry standard. In terms yeah, of, 
Probably, for him anyway, yeah. If you're in Sydney, you may as well sell now because you don't need to replace it because you can't drive anywhere anyway. You can't sell now, anyway. Sell now, replace in six months. <laughs> Forget Toyota. Everybody's yeah. car is perfectly reliable because they're not going anywhere. Um, yeah, 100%, right. 100% reliable. Um, now, we are going to go to our garage, but because, as we've hinted at, in Australia, in Sydney in particular and other parts, sadly, um, we're in a COVID-enforced lockdown. And I, for one, I know Steve's in a different place, but I, for one, haven't been doing much driving. I've been... Uh, Stuck at home, still working hard, which is great, and I'm very grateful for that, but not driving as much. So came up with a broad idea to maybe touch on our hero cars or a hero drive experience um, that, uh, that sticks in your mind. And, Steve, it's clear where you're going with this because it's actually mm-hmm. sitting behind you. Please tell us about it. Oh, I hadn't oh. noticed. <laughs> that's not bright. <laughs> I wish it was in my garage. So that's the KTM Crossbow, which is a... A car made by a motorcycle company. Now, my my love of motoring goes back to being a motorcycle enthusiast to start with. So for me, this car is everything I could want from, from a car because it makes me feel like I'm driving a motorbike. It's got no windows, no doors, no space <laughs> to put anything, no stereo and no driving aids whatsoever. No ABS, no traction control. You can actually see the tires when you're in it. You can see the suspension working and it is absolutely terrifying. If you drive behind anything, rocks fly into your face. You get smashed oh, by stuff. Um, it is it is visceral. People like people who are wusses wear helmets when they're driving it. But that's oh, no jeez, so and uh, and even better when Chesto drove it after me, it poured rain. Oh, and, good. And the good. I was going to say, there's good. some epic footage of him trying to soaked. speak to a camera while he's being drenched. That's so made me so happy. Car. He turned up at my house and, and poured himself out of it like a. <laughs> Just like a water we found out it had a little, it's got little holes drilled in it for the water to drip out after Unreal. it fills up. Because I had the day before, it was sunny. It was one of the probably one of the greatest days driving. So, what, I've ever what, had. Is, what is the engine then? It, it's not a motorcycle, it's an Audi S3. Right? It's an Audi it's S3. S3 engine, an Audi wow. S3 gearbox. And it weighs and how light is that thing? A, it weighs about as much as a bar. So, you can pick it up, yeah. you can pick it up, tuck it under your arm, and take it home. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I destroyed the I destroyed the power to weight by taking Boris Mihalovic, who's a giant uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. motorcycle outlaw, in it so to see if I could impress him. But and he, he never liked hand, a car before, but he liked that one. He liked left hand yeah. corners. In left hand corners, it would be like having a sidecar. You'd, yeah. you'd get actually yeah, put yeah. into a left hand yeah. corner much harder. Yeah. You're also sitting wow. quite uncomfortably close. You have to kind of rub hands every time you change gears. It's a bit, it's a bit oh, that's weird. nothing it's unusual for you, mate. You and Boris. So, yeah. awkward. Not usually yeah. with Boris. <laughs> Fantastic. And look, is it still a new car available in the Aussie market? Do you know? Well, yes. Yeah, so I, I just contacted them the other day to get that photo and you can still buy one. Yes. All right. Okay. Fantastic. And amazing, you can actually drive it on the road. Like it looks like something you can only take to racetracks. And really, it's 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 core uh, goal is as a track is car. There, is there you can like, legally drive it on the road. If you oh, were really? To move, if you were to move your head slightly, is there like a vestigial windscreen of any description or no? No, no windscreen at all. No, wow. no windscreen. So everything that, just smashes you in the face. Particularly rain. Really odd. I would have thought there's particularly rain. ADR that demanded a windscreen, but uh, not so. No, no. Well, it, 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 there's, there's several parts of it that look like they probably shouldn't pass ADR. Look at the mirrors. The mirrors are just sort of tacked on as an afterthought. Fantastic. But yes. And, and it sounds amazing as well because you're, you know, it's just, the whole thing just vibrates around you. You can't but it hear wouldn't, It wouldn't cause any interest on the road at all. It's a sleeper. Oh. You know, it's really a cue ship. You, you'd have no idea. Uh, People threw things reason. into the cabin at me, but that happens all the time too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Now, um, Crafty, a, an unlikely uh, marker for you. Yeah, please, for me. Please fill us in on your, your recent uh, hero drive, hero vehicle. Yeah, well, I could, you know, I could come up with a with a sort of expected one like a seventy series or a Jimny or a on the stress or a track. Rubicon or something yeah. like that. But uh, my <laughs> my uh, my sort of most recent mind blowing vehicle uh, was a Tesla X. Uh, believe it or not, we did it, and this was this was probably about two years ago. Malcolm Flynn kindly invited me on a tow test. Uh, with a Tesla X and a Land Cruiser 200 series. Um, so, you know, a decent towing platform uh, in its own right and by reputation, the 200. Uh, the Tesla X, I'd only ever had limited experience and, and never towing something, never under load in an electric vehicle. And my God, I was um, I was blown away. The I think it's 650 Newton metres um, mm. at, the, at the foot. And so incredibly quiet. 
the caravan wasn't massive, JC. It was probably about 1,800 kilograms, but, you know, probably about the, you know, similar to what people these days will tow as a recreational van. You know, it's not a horse float or anything like that. But um, we went up uh, from Bathur, uh, sorry, from Penrith out to Bathurst, so about 160 k's. A few hot laps of Mount Panorama. That's correct. Yeah, well, yeah, we did. We did go. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Uh, we did dip our uh, our tires under that um, yeah. for a little bit as part of the loop. You've got it. Um, yeah. The the range not so good. I think by the time we got to to Bathurst with that eighteen hundred keg caravan on, we only had about seventy k's left in the right. in the Tesla. Hmm. Um, and the Land Cruiser had another. I think it was four hundred k's. Uh, in the in the tank uh, estimated but that wasn't the point mate the point is is sort of pure unadulterated quiet immediate towing power like it it, it just blew me away like to, and and this was um up uh you know some of those decent hills through the blue mountains uh we came back on the bell's line of road um uh and um yeah great Un- unbelievable and Fantastic. just yeah. To me, was the most sort of instant and an immediate uh, you know, sort of gave me an idea of the future, and I can't wait for um, sort of EV four wheel drives, EV off roaders to be done properly, and uh, and to be in our market because if that was any indication of of sort of towing towing ability uh, and you know sheer fun as a driving experience too, build quality pretty dodgy. Uh, <laughs> but, what do you think uh, of the doors? To say the least, you like the doors? The, <laughs> yes, they're yeah. pretty, pretty. I think crazy. Crafty hung onto one for too long and actually lifted himself. I did, yeah. yeah. I yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, but, very was, <laughs> but you know, once all that technology uh, is is sorted out and is more accessible, you know, in terms of of, of budget for people, um, yeah, it's just going to open up the world to a whole bunch of other possibility so yeah a lot of fun uh, a little bit unusual for me not a not an off-roader um you know by by definition uh yeah. that thing but uh yeah, yeah just a good indication of the Unreal. Thing, that's a really good one that is a great one thank you crafty now i'll finish it off um this is a really rare car and uh, it's australian built uh, called the jicatolo um <laughs> group b jicatolo and uh it is actually a mid-engine Five liter Group A V8 uh, sports car, five speed ZF, rear wheel drive. Now, uh, I've got a little collection uh, in a cabinet at home for people on YouTube, you'll probably see it. I call it 50 great automotive experiences or something like that. Not necessarily great cars, but just, you know, and I can sit in front of that cabinet. They're all 143rd die cast and just think back to particular things I did. It's really um, uh, fun to do that. And this car's in there. It's in the 50. But if one goes in and one has to come out, it's like a rolling 50 of, of really good automotive experiences. I drove this car in early 1988. It was created by a guy called Paul Halstead. A lot of our viewers and listeners will know all about it. Um, he had a retail outlet in North Sydney uh, called The Toy Shop from 1985 to 88. And he sold exotic sports cars. He had a big connection with Di Tommaso and, uh, uh, and what have you. Then he started this car company, Gio Cotolo, um, in 1988, lasted till 1990. Um, he's still around and still has a W16 supercar project kicking around somehow. Um, he built a supercharged 427 HSV GTO, which became a show car. Um, the name for this car, uh, Jocatolo, uh, name means toy in Italian, so that's the toy shop connection. It was likely inspired by this Alpha Sud Sprint 6C that Alpha itself built as a Group B rally uh, prototype um, in the early 80s. But he set up a factory in Caloundra on the Sunshine Coast and made 15 of them. The intention was to make just under 100 per year. That didn't come to pass. But these little Alpha Sud Sprints in standard form had a 1.5 litre front engine driving the front wheels. This Ducatolo had a 5 litre mid-engine re- driving the rear wheels. And this was a Group A engine out of the Walkinshaw, you know, Batmobile um, Group A. But Holden's Engine Company, which was then a fairly entrepreneurial business trying to sell engines to the world, did him a special version with forged pistons and different lifters and bigger injectors and a tune and it had extra power um, and no rev limiter. So it, it revved to 6,100 RPM. It had a ZF gearbox, not the Borg Warner, that was in the Group A. The body was completely restructured. The rear suspension was done by a bloke called Barry Locke, who had experience with McLaren in 
F1 and IndyCar it was 385 kilos lighter than that Group A. The bonnet, the front guards, um, the bumpers, the bulkhead between the engine and the two seats was in Kevlar. It was plans for it to be carbon. It had Brembo brakes, Simmons wheels with big Pirelli P0s on it, Momo wheel, Recaro seats, and a flask of Bundy rum in the toolkit in case everything was oh. pear-shaped. And that was famously because it was from Queensland. But it was just the most amazing car. You always have these dreams of little car, big engine. That was this to the power of three or four. Um, and I was at Modern Motor magazine at that stage as a junior burger and got the chance to drive the car, keep it overnight. We had it for photography and it was quite something. At the time, talk about the crossbow, um, drawing attention, this thing did as well. It looked fantastic to my eyes, looked dramatic. And I know that of the 15, um, sadly, a couple have gone by the by, but most of them are, are treasured kind of um, very rare possessions. So that's one that sticks out for me. Did it break traction a bit? Was it a bit uh, hairy? <laughs> well, what I did find is if you leaned into the brake pedal, you know, if you wanted to, oh, this corner's coming up, I'll, I'll push it through this corner and lean. It wasn't as stable as you'd like it to be under braking. Ah. So now that's generally a, a suspension sorting thing. It's quite a short wheelbase, you know, for, for having the engine in the middle. Uh, but yeah, oh well, it was able to break traction, Steve. But uh, yes. not that I not that I did that. But not that I recall no. anyway. It's a while ago no. now, um, and it was a pretty rare and expensive car when when it was first mooted. Um, the the story that Barry Lake, uh, the then editor of Modern Motor, wrote said it was going to be sixty thousand or seventy nine, and then it got to ninety two, and and then the business was just not viable, and um, it went into administration. So a, a bright burst, but it, it didn't last uh, all that long. So there's very few of the actual car, but you've got a model of it. Yeah, I've got a model of it. I've right. got, and people on YouTube, are, it's from France, of all people. Wow. Uh, incredible. Uh, so a car that 15 examples of which were built, there's a 143rd <laughs> resin die cast there. of the car. Wow. There are probably more really of those it's, than the actual car. Yeah. It's even right-hand drive. The model is right-hand drive wow. of this uh, alpha-based thing. So it's in the, it's in the collection. Uh, but... It's not about cars, that collection. There's a tractor in there um, and uh, all kinds of things. But um, that's that's one of them. And it really stands out as a strong member. Cool. Awesome. All right. Now, let's move on to a bit of feedback from last week. And last week, we were talking about the fact that Chester had unearthed a sneaky trademark uh, application from GMSV for Z06, Z06, your preference uh, uh, in terms of how you pronounce it. Um, so an even... Wilder version of the mid-engine, talk about mid-engine V8s, um, the Corvette C8, uh, that isn't a thing even in the States yet, but it looks like it's headed our way. So Lofty Junior, uh, Lofty Vision, sorry, and I was going to say Lofty, I hope Lofty Junior is uh, in good shape, um, mm. has been a big V8 fan for a long time, but has a big announcement. He's got a new GR Yaris, and he wouldn't have a V8 again. Too much weight and power, small and nippy is a lot more fun. And... That's, I, I don't know, Steve, I'm presuming you've driven the, the GR Yaris. I don't know about you, Crafty, but that's one of my, it's in the collection, by the is way. It? Yes, yeah, oh, absolutely. It, it, it made an entrance fun. to the collection uh, last year. It is absolutely fantastic. So I can I've booked in it. another one just right. so I can drive it again. I yes. made up some ridiculous <laughs> excuse so I could borrow it again. Oh, I think I need to drive it again. <laughs> <laughs> it is superb. So congratulations on that, Lofty. And Roto Ehu says no one buys a C8 for US 60K. We're talking about what it might cost here and, and what it costs in the States. Uh, before COVID market craziness, average transaction price was close to 80K. And now even secondhand based C8s are making 100K plus. Whoa. Um, Chesto wondered if Aussie pricing and the dinosaur tick will impact sales. GMSV locally says the C8 is already a sellout. And Roto's prediction is that the Z06, um, if and when it arrives, will be a 250k car, and oh. GMS FSV will sell every unit it get its hands on. So that's that's his bold prediction. God, that's a, a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Mm. It's a lot, of, but but it's a half price Lambo, you know, or is it a high price muscle car? You know, <laughs> it, it just depends on on what your perspective. I don't um, have a half price Lambo, but uh, I've never driven a Corvette. I must admit, I'm very excited. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I remember drive. It's well, there's ZR1 King of the Hill um, in the collection, um, the first generation ZR1. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, Bill Catapotis said 
That vet may be a cool car to drive or even own, but I can't warm to buy a car from a company that's treated the people of this country with contempt. Uh, It's all too little and too late. So many better things to do with a couple of hundred K, I reckon. And he actually adds that he enjoys the podcast. Keep up the work, guys. Thank thank you very much. Uh, Bill, much appreciated. And Lofty Visions agreed. Uh, GM's a dead brand in Australia. That's a very strong sentiment amongst people that are still feeling the the pain of um, Holden having been uh, uh, you know, killed off in Australia. It's a, it's a very people that angry about Mitsubishi Magna as well. Like, they oh. get fired. <laughs> no, no, the three eighty, the the, the three eighty. Yeah. Oh, I wonder what three eighty is bringing in the second hand market. They must be through the roof. Perhaps yeah, it's not the same numbers. level of passion, mate. Um, no, perhaps, perhaps not. No. As you Navara people. <laughs> um, <laughs> then, uh, senior Bob, good day, senior. Uh, says Andrew, referring to Chesto. Uh, we know EVs are fast. Richard nails it. Now, Richard said that EVs actually stick a hole through your body and suck out your soul. Wow. Um, that's that's how he approaches EVs. Yeah. Yep. He, and Senior agreed. EVs suck out every bit of passion true car guys have. Hate EV <laughs> Greta. Now, I imagine he's referring to Greta Thunberg there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I hate EV, Greta-driven quiet cars, even though the fast ones narrow the vanishing point. I'll talk about how a really fast car causes your peripheral vision to disappear. Um, and he says, by the way, what a great movie. And uh, I don't know whether you guys have seen Vanishing Point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Kowalski. Um, yeah. Anyway. A driver, uh, driver Taycan and told me, a Porsche Taycan told me that there's no passion in that car. you got to be okay. kidding. Good call. That's a hell of a thing to drive. Good call. Good call. Yes. And it looks amazing too. Mm. Um, now, Andrew D, Chesto cops another surfy. And I did give him right a reply. I said, do you want to return, sir? But uh, haven't heard anything from him so far. Uh, what? El- electric cars are coming. Get off the grass, Chesto. Sure, eventually they'll become a bigger part of the landscape. But, mate, snails are moving faster than our take-up of EVs in Australia. And then Andrew actually quotes your story, Steve, um, from some time ago. 20,000 EVs since 2011. Hardly an impact or footprint, he says. A million new cars a year, which is what we sell in Australia, vehicles roughly uh, a year. And EV take-up is 0.7% of the market. England and Europe sitting at 10% take-up. He says, yeah, chicken little, the sky is falling. Sell your dinosaur V8 now. What emoji, screaming emoji. Um, I'm with Richard. Until Australia gets its act together, um, being massive infrastructure investment to cater for such EVs, plus massive incentives for us to do so by the federal government and state governments, we're just a backwater. So uh, it, it, it feels like the, the feds are sort of turning their head towards EVs and, and making some small moves, but it, I, I have to agree with him in, in the totality of it. We're nowhere near it. But is there an emoji for a whole country with its head stuck in the sand like ostriches? Because like the, the, the figure you need to look at, the number you need to listen to is 2026. Now, how close yeah. is 2026? That's five years away. Audi will not build a car yes. with an engine. They're not going yes. to build a car with an engine after 2026. It's five years. Mm. And when other car companies start saying the same thing, we can not want them as much as we like, but what, about, what are we going to buy? When yes. people stop making them, it's going to get... That's right. I remember there was a comedian in the States who said he'd cop some flack for photos of him in the 70s wearing flared pants, and he said, that's all you could buy. There yes. weren't any other kinds of pants <laughs> in the store. <laughs> so have a go at me all your life. But that, uh, that was what was available. I mean, we can talk about our choice and our desires as much as we like and what we want to drive. But uh, if you can't buy one, it's going to get real tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now, Sukhoi Romantic, uh, the person who loves fast Russian fighter jets, uh, he said he saw on the Smoking Tire podcast, and I've got to say I'm a bit of a Matt Farah fan, um, that Zach, that Zach Clapman, um, he did a hydrogen trip. We were talking about hydrogen power as a potential for particularly heavy vehicles as a, as a good way around the replacement of diesels. And in the explainer, Zach said that you have to wait for the hydrogen tanks to repressurize to get decent flow to refuel after another car has gone through. So convenience of not having to wait like an EV car disappears if you're second in the queue. Um, he liked the car, that is Zach liked the Nexo, but it sounded like a shit show. <laughs> and <laughs> I've got to say that with some recent experience of refueling uh, hydrogen cars, he's absolutely right. And Grudland74 says, hydrogen fuel cell definitely has a future in Australia, the trucking industry, but with a fueling station to tricky to set up. You basically have to have the plant and station in one. It's an economy of scale problem. 
Um, and he says, our own CSIROs discovered a way to transport hydrogen in ammonia mix like normal fuel. And I'll get onto that in a minute. But he's right. We were fueling up some hydrogen cars. The story will be uh, forthcoming soon. And a car had just beat us to it when we arrived. And we had to wait for the system to recharge itself and, and uh, cool down such that we could refuel another car. Now, that will inevitably improve, I suspect, as if and when take-up uh, increases. But it is definitely a factor right now. Have either of you guys driven a fuel cell vehicle? Yeah, I recently had the Nexo and uh, it could only be when it arrived, I, thought, I couldn't work out what had happened with the range, but apparently with the fuel filling station at Hyundai, they could only, they only have enough pressure to fill it up to halfway. Halfway, yes. yes like it only right. had half the range. But it's, you know, it's one of those things where we could fix it. And if, if we do fix it and hydrogen becomes the future, Australia actually has the potential to be the, you know, the Saudi Arabia of hydrogen. Yes. We've got these massive, massive things kicking off in WA and so on that, as you say, the ability to move it and, and transport it. There's yes. another company in Australia that's um, working on being able to store hydrogen in, in pods at your house. So you could turn solar energy into hydrogen that you can then keep and run, run your house on it, run your car on it. All that seems a very, uh, Fantastical, but it's not that long ago that I thought EVs were fantastical. Yes, well, that's true. I mean, <laughs> further to Grudlin's point about the transport of it, um, the head of CSIRO, Dr. Larry Marshall, who I must say was in my year at school, Balgala Boys High, all the way. <laughs> um, so he, uh, he and I know each other. I've got friends, you know, in high places. He wishes um, he had your job. Yeah. It's actually <laughs> how, how far some of us have come. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> It's called a very Aussie name, called hydrogen cracker technology, and it turns, quote, gaseous hydrogen into liquid ammonia and back again. The membrane in this technology separates ultra-high purity hydrogen from ammonia while blocking all other gases. It links hydrogen production, distribution, and delivery in the form of a modular unit, which I think is what you were talking about, Steve, that can be used at or near a refueling station. So this sounds like something of a breakthrough on hydrogen. Mm. I interviewed the, the guy, the head of the Hydrogen Council last week, and he's saying that the future is you'll have your EVs for, for city cars, yep. but you want to go longer distances in Australia there and, and heavy vehicles and even so trucks, trains, heavy vehicles, uh, marine, all hydrogen, and even things like SUV. So your SUV would be, you know, that would be hydrogen, fuel cell on board, fast refueling, longer range, but in cities, EVs. And it, it kind of be- makes sense, but it does seem that the, the, the infrastructure problem is enormous. Because to your point, Crafty, with the, the Model X and towing, the thing about hydrogen, one of the benefits potentially, is that you have the electric motor, but you don't have to carry an enormous battery. The hydrogen tank is mm. comparatively small, and the yeah. load of hydrogen that you need for a decent range is only, you know, maybe it's 10 kilos. Yeah. Um, is is how much you need. So it's a. And at the moment, with the technology as it is, the, the batteries are heavy uh, by their very it. nature. So, uh, yeah. So add to your load without actually loading anything in, you know, before exactly. you before you go anywhere, it's already quite heavy. Now to 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 finish it off, Stuart Marler says, "Stop teasing us about the missing two cylinders in the Outback." And I I was talking about having driven the Outback <laughs> last week. It's not a flat six; it's a flat four. Um, well, boxer technically, and that's good, Stuart. <laughs> You're the only one that fell for it when I was talking about that. Like, well done. <laughs> Um, I can only say that it was muscle memory. I'm so used to <laughs> that outback as a, a six-cylinder car. Anyway, so well spotted. Thank you. Um, and with that, we have reached the finish line. And I, I want to say thank you, Steve. And thank you, Crafty. Oh, thanks very much, Mike. No, very, thank you. And thank, oh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Crafty. <laughs> and thanks to our lead document shredder, Master Juggler and Pancake Guru, Mr. Pritchard, for his commitment to the Cars Guide podcast cause. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, in dog beers, I've only had one. Um, manga shorts and Subway footlong Velcros. Amazing, amazing shoes. They, they look delicious. Um, jump into the conversation, Cars Guides on Facebook and Instagram, or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Um, Apple podcast listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Five stars would be great, um, but uh, rating and reviewing really helps other people find the podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, two blokes on the same country road approaching a rickety wooden bridge from opposite directions. 
only wide enough for one car and sure enough, they both go for it, arriving at the bridge at the same time and meeting in the middle. First bloke sticks his head out the window and yells, I don't make way for idiots. Second guy rolls his window down and shouts back, I do, as he starts reversing off the bridge. <laughs> 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 ah, good stuff. Oh.